With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Heard Tell. Ah, welcome back to Herd Tell. Okay, let's talk some economics with our buddy, Stephen Popic. We haven't had him on for a long time. He tweets under Moto Economist. He is not at a three-letter federal institution. He's at a four-letter federal institution, but we will not hold that against him for the purposes of this conversation. That's also Dr. Stephen to him, although he doesn't use that much. He knows economics, my friend. So explain it to me like I'm five, buddy. Well, I've been I've been away for a little while, for about a month or two. I was uh, not, not in the country, so... Happy to talk econ today. I guess uh, we're hot off the presses with uh, yet another jobs report. Seems like every month we all freak out about a jobs report. Let me tell you about my vacation. I took the I went on vacation the day before Trump got shot, and I was having my daughter's wedding about two hours after Biden stepped aside and announced that on that Sunday. So that was my vacation. <laughs> so yeah. I picked a heck of a two weeks to take off. You know what I would like for both of us in 2025? Peace, quiet, and boredom. A very boring year. A very boring. I'm with you, buddy. Let's do some (laughs) boredom. Let's start with that jobs report because here's the thing. We do jobs reports. The official ones are quarterly. The ones that really matter are yearly. Mm -hmm. Give us us lay folks something to pick through because on the surface, this job reports ain't good. Um, It's not horrific, but it's not good as... The joke is unexpectedly because everything's unexpected, which means you didn't prepare to start with. Walk the lay people through how to handle a breaking news thing like jobs report is not good. Jobs report is good because it's all context. It's all numbers. None of us uh, outside of you folks that do this all the time really know what this stuff really means other than how the news frames it. Give us a way to get into these sorts of things and use this one as an example, if you want to, of how to actually understand it so that we get what we need without all the noise. Yeah, well, let's back up a bit and let's first explain, at least or remember, you know what's been going on in the economy for the last two years, and 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 what what's been and what the Federal Reserve has been trying to do with their lack of changing in the interest rate. See, the Federal Reserve has been trying to contain uh, and slow down inflation, which I think you know was five, six, seven, eight percent at the height of the pandemic across the U.S. Uh, and recently, we've got uh, inflation numbers now that just came out. Uh, a week or two ago, uh, that said that currently we're looking at about 2.5% year-over-year inflation. This is leading a lot of economists um, and policymakers to think that we're getting close to taming the inflation uh, dinosaur right now, um, which is good news, right? The the high the the, the ever increasing prices they're slowing down. They're going back to a normal rate of increase. We need a normal rate of increase in the economy. Deflation's not good for the long-term health of an economy. What we're not going to get back is the decline in purchasing power that we had during COVID um, with the with that high inflation that we had. We're not going to get back to those days. Sorry, prices are not going to go back down 20%. But the Federal Reserve has kept interest rates very high despite a lot of pressure from Republicans and Democrats. Um, to sort of tame down this beast of inflation. They've been watching what is inflation doing and what is unemployment doing. And they're playing a dance, a tango between these two. And they're they're trying to to look for inflation getting under control and the labor market starting to soften up. And when you have have, uh, those two facts lining up, right, inflation being tamed, job market softening, that's when they had signaled that they'd start consider cutting rates, which are about five and a quarter right now. Um, and I think before the pandemic, we were very low, um, lower than I thought we thought we could be, uh, I think in the mid threes. So they've been waiting for this kind of, pol- this is what the Fed's been waiting for, right? So when first people say this is a disappointing jobs report, I have to say, I don't know what kind of economic reporter you are, and where you've been living for the last two years, this is the jobs report the Fed's been waiting for. Because last week, Jerome Powell came out, right, and he said very clearly, he is open to a September rate cut. See, the Fed's tracking some of this stuff too. They get information in real time, you know, using their own surveys, 
often, you know, before even the BLS result comes out, you know, so they had a good sense that they were going to get, I think, a jobs report that was going to look like this, which, as I said, is meeting their, their two things that they're looking for, inflation being tamed and the job market softening. Well, yes, the job market here is softening, right? Unemployment did go up. We're still at historically low levels of unemployment. Remember back before, before I guess, the, the, the 2010s or whatnot, we as economists never thought that you could run an economy for, for a long time at a sub-4% unemployment rate. And yet, through the, night, through, through the 2010s, we ran an economy with quite often a sub-4% unemployment rate. Uh, and saw relatively low, well, we saw really low inflation. Not relatively, we saw really low inflation. So, you know, that's sort of surprise folks. So, so I think this is getting us back to sort of the, the norm for unemployment that we were expecting. Um, you know, I, I'm going to note also that, you know, in this report, you know, I also pay attention to what happened to the, the estimates from the prior months, the estimates of unemployed and jobless claims for the last two months did go up as well, but fairly marginal. You know, one thing that st stands out to me in the BLS report, these are surveys, Andrew. You know, this is not a one-to-one -one accounting of the jobs market. You didn't get contacted if you have a job. I didn't get contacted if I had a job. There are errors, there are error bars associated with these, me the, these measurements, you know? Um, and so it's hard for me, you know, looking at this, you know, you can't really say, is this a real change, right? Um, you know, exactly how much did it tick up? We don't see that, you know, they, they treat it as more definitive than it actually is. Um, but, you know, what we're seeing here, right, is, again, you know, uh, I actually, the, sorry, the, the biggest driver of these unemployment changes are actually People who are on a temporary layoff, because that went up by almost 1 million people in month over month, uh, but the total number of people that, that had lost their job permanently hadn't really changed. Long-term unemployed hadn't really changed. So I think this has driven, hasn't there been a sector, I believe, that's uh, been in the news for a lot of uh, a lot of layoffs and a, and a lot of uh, hour shortening right now, Some something in IT, I guess. Um, you know, so I think that's, that's what's driving it right now. So look, I, I, I generally am looking at this report and I'm saying this is exactly what the Fed wanted to see to cut a rate in September. I'm going to go out on a limb right now and boldly make a prediction. We're going to get a rate cut in September. I, that, that seems pretty locked in right now. Now, September, of course, is important in the economic world because that's, you know, technically the last month of the fiscal year. So what does that practically mean, though? Because we hear things like rate cut, interest rate, inflation, jobs number, unemployment number. The thing that's hurting folks is they just know when they go to the store, stuff's more expensive. They know it that. Is. That's, that's is. all they know. And I don't like the word vibe, but this is a vibe economics discussion because it just feels one way and it doesn't matter what chart you got. You're not going to unconvince people that, well, things aren't good because gas is expensive and food's expensive. Relative, yeah. what I, that's a relative term to their POV in whatever world they live in, mm -hmm. but that's how about 90% of people in the world feel right now is gas is too expensive, food's too expensive, everything's expensive, economy's not good. I understand on paper there's some foundations to the economy that's good. We could talk about national debt and that stuff later. What would an actual rate cut mean? Because if you're just doing, you know, what are they going to do, a quarter point or something like that, might do a half if he really gets a wild hair. Does that really mean anything to the average person? Because again, like you're saying, this is long-term planning stuff. You know, they're landing a blimp here. This isn't a sports car where they're doing a U-turn, right? They're, they got to adjust it now, adjust it, adjust it. This is the vibe and the actual steering of this stuff is two very different things. So what does that rate cut actually mean to people? Because they're not going to see that at the grocery store the one October. Well, look, as I said, you know, we have we had the COVID economy where we saw rapid price increases, um, you know, and, and wages did not keep up. So, yes, people felt the pinch and rightly they should like that is, you know, I, I sometimes feel like my like my fellow economists that are out there in policy wonks don't say I acknowledge the pain and, and your feelings that your 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 dollar isn't going as far. It it isn't. We, we know that um, what economists are saying is 
yes, we, we know we've been through a lot of pain with painful price rises. The, the, the how prices are rising are getting back to a more normal level. So, you know, that's a good sign, which is, yes, that's a good sign. It's not getting worse now, but, you know, we're not going to make up what we, well, what we had happen during COVID. Um, not for a while anyways. Although, you know, I got to be a two-handed economist here. You know, the same report here show, tells us that the wage, the average wage gains or median wage gains, sorry, went up by 3.6%. Inflation in that same period went up by 3%. So that's a 0.6% real increase in incomes, right? So that will help tame the what happened with inflation over time, but it's going to take a long time for those small deltas between wage growth and inflation to add up. Now, what does this mean for the average for, for, for most folks? What the Fed's trying to do is you can't control inflation if you're seeing a lot of wage growth. You just can't. They're sort of feeding off of each other. The more money that's out there chasing, you know, chasing goods in the system, the more that folks are going to mow the business are going to be able to raise their prices. Just simple money demand. Um, you know, uh, so you know what? What I guess we're 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 uh, we can say here is, you know, the Fed's going to cut rates probably a quarter of a point, probably 25 basis points, simply because they're cautious. They don't want to overstep things. This is the first signal they're getting to actually cut. I wouldn't expect a 50 basis point. I'd be a little bit shocked personally at that. Um, you know, what? I, but I think it's there to say, you know, what they're going to try to do is say, okay, now that this is controlling the next, we're now going to be waiting more about making sure unemployment doesn't get too much higher, right? Because people being out of a job is a really bad thing. You know, having a little, you know, you're going to have some inflation, but but being out of a job is very, very bad, right? And so now that inflation has been appearing to be tamed or close to being tamed, now's the time to focus a little bit more about making sure unemployment doesn't go crazy again. And so by lowering interest rates, the Fed's going to essentially lower the, the cost of borrowing. They're, these interest rates affect like the, the, the intraday bank um, lending rates, which then filter out to the rest of the economy. So, you know, hopefully there, by lowering the rates, you know, they, they begin to incentivize business growth, um, job growth, you know, stabilize that so, so that, you know, we don't have um, unemployment that starts to spike up just like inflation did four years ago. We don't want to be yo-yoing between periods of high inflation and high unemployment. That, that would not be ideal. Brace yourself for something fuel nominal. Unleaded 88 is the clear fuel choice. It's cheaper, cleaner, and greener. And it's grown by Iowa corn farmers. Now that's totally worth the hype. So pump it up with Unleaded 88. Stephen Kapodnik joining us, economist. I always say that. I don't know why I put an extra syllable in your name. I'm sorry. I just it's habit. I don't know why I do it. I, I don't care, man. I don't. I don't care. know. It's too much hillbilly and that Eastern European stuff. We just hey, don't handle hey, it really hey, well. We, um, we don't need to talk about any hillbilly uh, elegy books. We would just we would just rant about how awful of a book that was for a while. No, I don't. I don't care what the kid that grew up in our north of Cincinnati thinks about anything involving hills. Um, I, I wonder one thing. We used to talk about it a lot more than we do now. The value of the dollar. Now that has a large economic, like what is it against the euro or the British pound sterling or the rupee or pick whatever you want. The value of the dollar, when you get down to the basics, a lot of this housing, your wages, how far that goes, inflation. It's really the value of the dollar for the individual citizen of the United States of America. That's really the basics of consumer economics, right? What's that dollar yeah. worth? How far it'll go? How do you manipulate that either higher or lower based on what you need to do? The value of the dollar. Which is going to be different in San Francisco, California, 
versus Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Correct. So how do we how do we go back to the basic fundamentals? If I remember the first econ class I ever ever took, they he started out holding up the dollar bill and says, "We are going to talk about this, but we won't talk about this again till the end of the course because we got to go through all this." And he waves at the the board with all the stuff on it so we can get back to what this means, which was an excellent answer and an excellent way to intro it. How do we set the value of the dollar in its proper place discussing economics? Because really, that is the basic building block to the normal consumer, the normal person, the normal person listening to this or watching this on YouTube. What is my dollar actually worth? How do we kind of reset that into the discourse? I think, you know, one, it's going to have to be a local conversation since costs of living vary quite a bit across the U.S., but we should talk about the value of the dollar in terms of people being able to do what they like to do. You know, when folks report they can't take their kids on not an extravagant vacation, but just a, just a short vacation, the value of the dollar probably isn't enough. When people report that they're not able to afford food and they're skipping a lunch, you know, maybe the value of a dollar isn't enough. Right. So I would say let's think about it in more practical terms. Like what what does it what does it get? Um what does it get for 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 a family? And recognize that's gonna be different in a lot of places. And make sure that we're giving people, you know, the, the policy we should, we should be aiming for is giving people opportunities to have the jobs, to have the the um financial security, you know, to be able to go for things that we once took for granted in America, right? Um, and I don't mean extravagances. I, I was actually watching a YouTube video um, last night and it was one of these, um, I hardly watch these things, but it was one of these crash interviewers and he was talking to this woman who had a had a kid and he was asking her how much, you know, how much do you make? And she said, well, you know, my, you know, she was a young woman with a kid. Her husband um, earns 30,000 a year. And he's like, isn't that, what do you have to live? What would you say you have to live to live comfortably? And she says, 30,000 a year. It's hard, but we make it work. Um, you know, we're, we're clothed, we're fed, you know, it's not an, it's not a lavish lifestyle, but we're comfortable and we're happy because, you know, we know, you know, what we value is, is each other and our kids. And the interviewer just wasn't getting it, you know, that, that you could be happy on, on, on 30 K. But it was an appreciation for her. She understood her cost of living. They clearly understood how to budget. Um, and they understood how to make priorities and changes. And so what we should be doing, I hope, is for folks across the U.S., we we'll give them, you know, the, the economic policies and opportunities that allow them to basically have those not lavish but, but comfortable lifestyles. I hope that makes sense. You know, no, it makes I sense, and I and I, I it makes sense, and I did it to this because one economic thing that I do pay a whole lot of attention to that doesn't get talked about by those talking heads a lot are I watch the personal debt numbers a lot, and there has been it's in it's in give me the big word for it it's indisputable now as we've came out of COVID I've been watching it over the last what almost two years now out of COVID it's undeniable what has happened is. To combat inflation, people have taken on personal debt to maintain lifestyle coming out of COVID as inflation came up. That's not arguable. Across the board, I know it's not every single person, but on the average, most Americans, that's what a lot of them have done. That's not an economic indicator that shows up until later, but that's a troubling sign that I pay attention to. Those, those little things you see now and then, like how many Americans have $500 of emergency savings if they needed it right now, go get it personal debt loads, things like that. When you combine it with everything else, now we're talking about a real economic thing that's not getting talked about, but now all of a sudden you can explain that vibe part we started with that the talking heads sometimes don't fully understand, but the average folks fully understand it. And that kind of compensating for inflation with personal debt, we all know that's not real great economic policy, but in a short term, a lot of folks are doing it. And that's part of this whole story in the economics, isn't it? It is. Um, and, and, you know, we, you know, 
keep in mind also, right? You know, so it's not just personal debt, Andrew. I will have to correct you, unfortunately, on one thing here. Um, I'm it's wrong on a lot of things. Go for it. It's the carrying cost of that personal debt, right? So if you are, so if you could have someone who has a thousand dollars on their credit card, but they're paying it off in a hundred dollar installments every month, and they're going to be paying a zero percent interest rate. That's an entirely different story than someone with a thousand dollars on their credit card paying a twenty percent interest rate, right? One is one and one has a much lower carrying cost, right? And so to the we'd have to understand sort of what what are what are the expenses of carrying that debt rather than just the debt itself. Um, one of my comments, and you talked about it, you know, I hear it a lot, you know, the national debt. Yeah, well, the national debt goes up every day. It will always go up every day. That that's just the national debt. Like the day that we see the national debt actually be negative and go down, I'll be like, really? I think it had well. It happened once for a couple of months back when was it was it Bill Clinton was president and the Republicans had Congress and I don't know something happened for ninety six ninety seven one yeah. for like six months yeah yeah for six months which is obviously an aberration you know it's about what the carrying cost on the best economy we've ever seen post World War II by the way but that's another <laughs> part of it yeah and in that one they just weren't able to raise government spending enough to uh, to spend all the all the extra money we were getting from a great economy. Um, and Europe and, had just reunified, so Eastern Europe and you know yeah. Germany was down. There was a lot that went into that. Yeah, well, maybe maybe, maybe Great Britain can uh, come back into the EU, and that'll that'll juice the economy for a couple of years. Oh, probably. see, now you're yeah. just stirring up trouble. No, nah, obviously, I'm not being serious about that. Um, so no, but to to go back, um, so I want to know, you know, how that carrying cost is going to change over time. Like clearly, now, you know. You know, if if consumers wind up, you know, those if if interest rates if interest rates decline, you know, the carrying cost of debt will decline a bit more. Um, but you know, if consumers are carrying debt that are in these high interest rate products and they're not paying off their credit lines, you know, they're buying homes where, you know, yes, they have a high interest rate, and yes, that that payment is going to be hard for them to manage. You know, something like back in the days of the 05, 06, where we had all those ninja loans and those high cost balloon loans that thankfully don't exist too much anymore. Um, but if we see debt that's being carried like that, that's a danger sign. That's a warning sign, you know, as, as you said. But I don't look at the absolute level of debt itself to be as much of a red flag. Um, it's certainly a it's certainly a warning indicator, but it's not a strong warning indicator. It's much like um the inverted yield curve is a it's a warning indicator of a recession, but it's not perfectly predictive. Or the SOM rule, warning indicator for a recession, not necessarily perfectly predictive, right? So if we start seeing a lot of these red lights popping off, then I'm going to start getting concerned. If if we only see one or two red lights popping off, I might just say, uh, that's noise. You know. All right. Some rule, you just brought it up. As we're recording this, we got that job report out. The SOM rule is now trending on Twitter because that is the soundbite of the day. Everybody's a SOM rule expert. It's all over. All the big things. I'm sitting here watching it go viral. SOM rule recession. It's only been wrong once ever since 1950, blah, 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 blah. This is going to be the buzzword going into the weekend. Clearly, as SOM rule, we're all going to go to accession. Everybody panic. Obviously, this is politically driven by a lot of folks. Is this noise? Is this a head pat? Should we panic? Sort this out. Tell people what the SOM rule is. I mean, and is it triggering? And is this something that we should be worried about right this moment? So the SOM rule was, it's named after uh, Claudia SOM, who was an economist at the Federal Reserve Board. What it does is basically tracks the unemployment rate, sort of in a moving average. Right. And asks if the moving average rises by a certain amount, then that triggers the SOM rule. In other words, it moves so much that, you know, it moved from from 3.6 to 4.3. You know, that is more than that is that is, that is more more than uh, about a, I think it's about a half a percent, um, you know, in the calendar year. So that's going to trigger a recession. Right. That, that's what Claudia Claudia SOM's rule is. And look. She's the author of it. And I think that if you went to her Twitter page, 
she would say, I think she's actually said, yes, the rule triggered. It may not be the signal that my research said it was in the past. So, you know, take it from the, the person who's responsible for the rule to say, hey, in this case, maybe a little bit of caution is warranted here. You know, it's triggered. Remember, we had yield curves that are also, you know, inverted yield curves are often, you know, talked about as a sign of a recession. Well, we've had a couple of inverted yield curves happen, Andrew, in the last 10 years um, where there was no recession that followed afterwards, right? It is true that typically if we have an inverted yield curve, there'll be a recession, typically, but it's not true uh, in all cases. And I think that's the same for the SOM rule here. So again, you know, if we saw an inverted yield curve, we saw the SOM rule trigger, if we saw more geopolitical, you know, instabilities, domestic instabilities, um, if we if we saw, you know, uh, investment activity start to dive, um, if we saw business starts start to decline, things like that, all of this would then tell me, yeah, we're, we're seeing a, a negative pattern. I don't react on just one indicator. So what, what I would suggest to, to everyone is, you know, to the, to the, to the non-economist folks that might listen to this, all five of them, um, hey, you know, don't put all your eggs in one indicator in one basket, you know, look at everything and then look at your own personal situation. Speaking of peaks and valleys, though, this interest rate stuff is interesting because I get those crank calls all the time where they want to buy my house or somebody wants me to trade in my car. And my first thing is like, well, yeah, cause look, my house has appreciated value tremendously the last few years. It's it's yep. I could. But the problem is there's no way I'm going to sell it because my interest rate is going to be probably at least double what it what it is right now locked into it. A lot of people in that situation, because when times are. are good. Set, you know, I've had my house seven, that 10 to 15 year window you get before that, you get back into the, the last financial crisis. But people that had those, you know, right around three interest rates, like I oh, do, yeah. they're, they're not going to sell their house. That creates housing pressure. Housing is one of your specialties. Talk yeah, about, by the way, Andrew, you're absolutely right. Remember, and I want to be clear when we talk about, you know, these, these figures, we're talking about sort of averages, right. Of, of people, right. You know, the, you know, the, the middle experience, but we are ignoring the fact that, yeah, hey, by the way, if you owned a house, if you're one of Americans, the 60% of Americans that own their house on a fixed rate mortgage, everybody refied during COVID. Like there was not, it was, there was very, very, very few homes that would be in the money for a refi that didn't, like vanishingly small. Like everybody paid attention. Everybody got a sub three interest rate, you know, or around a three. Like that. So, so those folks, they, with the with their housing price appreciation right they're sitting on you know a lot of equity in their house so they're you know that's a good thing for them but then if you were renting you had a very different experience right and so there is we talk about it being a k-shape recovery right there are groups that are doing much better than others and we need to recognize that because just talking about the average mass that but anyways my digression but I don't know if it's an economic term, but our economy on the on the consumer side for homeowners, car owners, working class folks, uh, probably, you know, upper middle class and down. Let's just take that demographic because that's probably most of the people that are listening to this. There's a compression thing going on because people aren't selling their house. People aren't buying new cars because of the interest rate. And it goes to that rental thing you just talked about. I'll just use an example. I've got a bunch of apartments and townhouses and homes being built within about a mile of me. So same distance to stores, same distance to schools, same neighborhoods, all that stuff's the same. And their rents are the rent is so freaking high on places now. The the rent is outstripping what people pay for their houses that have those rates. 
that's the compression. I don't know what the fancy economic term for that is, but that's what people really notice is like, well, wait a minute, these folks that have had their houses and refinanced during COVID, all of a sudden your rent's a lot more than what most people are paying for mortgages for really nice houses. People are having to pay more for rent. People are having to pay more to get a new car if they need a new car. People are having to pay more to get that starter home. That's that compression effect. And that's kind of at the core of maybe why some of this economic stuff is incongruent to from your side where it's people with numbers and letters behind their names and that stuff and the actual people. Is that a fair way to lay it out? Yeah, well, let, let's talk about, you know, what 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 it means when you have a sub 3% interest rate. Andrew, would you ever consider moving right now? Would you sell your home uh, and move up to anywhere else, you know? Yeah, but no. for just just for the full disclosure, I would make money selling my house. I would make a very good profit. Um, yes, off the top of my head, let me do some quick math here. I'd probably make about a 15 to 20% profit on what I paid for the house, even with mm -hmm. the mortgage that remains. That's a, that's a very good return on my house. The problem is I would have double the interest rate, minimum double the interest rate, probably a little bit more than that because I'm, I'm right at sub three. I'd probably get about a seven right now. Yeah. So, so I'm going to lose a quarter of that right off the top, just getting a new house, not putting in the $20,000 you're going to spend moving, blah, 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 blah. So, so no, I really is, wouldn't. No. The answer is no, you wouldn't. You know, Was that a responsible you, way to answer that question, Mr. Economist? Yeah, though? Because yeah, that's yeah. thinking it out because I've thought I about mean, it. Unless you are having a, a family illness, major job change or major family change, you're not packing up and moving right now if you're already a homeowner. Um, and so that actually will keep housing prices fairly high because we don't build enough housing in this country. We don't build enough housing anywhere. Um, and you have a whole bunch of people that might want to move, but they're not going to because they are locked in. Um, that will exacerbate sort of the feelings that you were talking about, the haves and the have nots of the great housing price appreciation for the last five years. Um, but it also affects the labor market, right? Because you have a, a fairly large contingent uh, of folks who can't or don't want to move for a job, right? Because they're locationally constrained now. They would, you know, the amount that they'd have to earn in a new job to make up for the high priced home they have to buy at the high interest rate they'd have to take for the mortgage, it's just not going to work for that. So, you know, that, that is a, that is a challenge too. And yes, well, little violin for all those folks, you know, like you and like me that have these sub 3% mortgages with the home that return to good appreciation. We don't need any sympathy, honestly, but I, I bring that up just so folks understand that that also is going to affect the labor market because in a normal labor market, right, people would have the ability to up and move for a better job. Right. And essentially what you have net right now is folks on the low end can't move because they're priced out of rents in these in these other areas. And maybe maybe they're OK where they are, but they're slowly, you know, they might be facing you know high rental price increases. And then folks that own the homes. They're having low housing costs right now, but they would face high housing costs if they had to move. So that's a tension that the Fed's also monitoring. You know, that's a weakness in the economy that's not really talked about that role of housing. And I brought it up not because, look, I live a blessed and privileged life. I'll Let me just say that. It's isn't a complaint. I'm setting it up for this question because I have, my children are all, my youngest is 16, almost 17. So I basically got all young adults, right? So this is all active conversation. My daughter, our older, just, just got married here, you know, a week and a half ago. Um, the 21, yeah, it, it worked out good, but you know, they both have jobs. They're older. She's 26, he's 30. So, you know, they're, they're basically adults. I'm not real worried about them. My kid that's in college right now wants to get married, getting almost done with college. Her, her, mm -hmm. you know, boyfriend probably be fiance pretty soon. You know, he, he's almost done with college. They're having a really hard time navigating this. Well, I have to work this, this, and this just to find somewhere to live. My 18 year olds mm -hmm. having active conversations right now, like if they're going to live anywhere near because my 18 year old's still at home with me to live anywhere near where I live, their rent would be higher than the mortgage I'm paying on my house. And I'm in my mid 40s with equity and means and, you know, yeah. liable income. They're coming right out of high school looking to go into, you know, trade school or college or whatever they decide to do with their partner. 
And they're like, how are we going to live on two service sector entry level jobs? And they trying to figure out that you can't do it. And we're navigating that. There are there's a whole generation that's doing that right now because, you know, I work with young voices, the highly college educated kids coming out with master's degrees or my kid that just wants to go to trade school after she graduates from alternate school here because I'm very proud of her because she went back and got her high school cleaned up after some personal challenges. Those two things get treated differently in economics because they're supposed to be different social steers and economic steers. They've got the exact same problem. Master's degrees to people that just are graduating high school or not graduating high school, trying to get in the service sector. They got the same problem. They can't find anywhere to live. Mm -hmm. That's going to have a ripple effect generationally through the next five, 10, 15 years of the economics, because what's happening is you're smarter than me. You can probably quantify this better. You're taking an entire generation of kids and you're putting them five to 10 to 15 years behind where our generation was when they got out of college or went into their career. Like I didn't go to college. I went to college briefly and then went in the military. You went to college, but it, but it set us up and we were on that normal 20 to 30 year path that ideally an economist would say you should be on job and career wise. Mm -hmm. If you can't get housing right out of the gate, you're behind the ball and you're going to spend most of the rest of your life catching back up. Right. That's yeah, an economic a, indicator we need to be talking about. There, there's a lively debate in econ right now. Um, about whether Gen Z is worse off than previous generations or not. Um, and it's a little bit murkier now, not for your family situation. The answer is yes. <laughs> but, well, hold on. I'm gonna get Are they better so, or worse? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, better, 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 yeah, yeah, I got you on that one. Um, you know, where you have folks like uh, Scott Galloway uh, from NYU, I believe he's NYU, um, talking about how Gen Z is, is so much worse off. You know, um, and about the struggles that you said with, with housing and with with jobs and, and things like that. Whereas you have other economists, um, I'm thinking of the Yuri from Money and Macro, who say, "Wait a second, not all these facts line up right." You know, you have Raj Chetty who says, "Oh no, actually, I, I think that the Gen Z is worse off." Um, sort of, I'm thinking this may be distinctions without a difference here, um, because perceptions matter, um, and certainly, you know. Um, if we if we think about it, right, Gen Z's and making a choice that we didn't see in in my generation, our generation, Andrew, because you and I are pretty much the same age, uh, despite me looking way more youthful than you. Um, <laughs> Got to get the dig in here just a little it's bit. It's just the gray um, in the beard. That's all. Hey, you know, so so what I'm saying is like, you know, we. Um, the, the for for the for the for the Gen Z, you know, it it feels like for them that jobs don't have continue like as we've seen, jobs don't have the same tenure, right? They're they're now looking at instead of switching careers every few years or switching you know um, firms to work for every few years, which is what Gen X sort of did and the millennials. Um, you know, they're looking at the gig economies and stuff like that, where there's much less sort of um, labor safety net, so to speak. Um, they're looking at much higher housing costs. Um, they're having to they're having to delay moving out of their parents' homes um, quite a bit because of housing costs. So they're living at home for a couple of years after graduation um, to sort of save up money to even be able to afford to be able to live on their own, um, if that can happen. Um, some folks look at, you know, the, the housing wealth and other wealth that the, that the boomer generation, you know, has and, and would say, well, when, when the boomer generation passes away, that will all be inherited by, by the, by the younger generations that will solve the wealth gap. Spoiler alert, it will not. Um, it's just, it's not going to work out that way. Um, and then at the end of it also, look, I'm going to come back to it. We in this country have made a decision in our local politics. This is not a Dem issue. This is not a, Repub a Republican issue. This is not a Green Party issue, you know, or whatever the hell RFK is. Um, this is this is a local politics issue where we have pretty much decided we're just not going to build housing. Um, and if we are going to build housing, we're going to build housing that only the one and two percent really want to have. So we're just not giving options for folks. So that's why. That's why it's expensive, you know. We that's a conscious choice that we've made, um, and you know I can I can point to, you know, very 
liberal cities that have awful housing policies like San Francisco, where over 92% of their land is zoned for single family only. In other words, you're not giving homeowners an option to build a duplex. And by the way, there's a lot of duplexes that are out there that if you and I drove past them, you would have no idea that was a duplex. You know, so it's not changing the character of the neighborhood in any way, shape, or form, you know, by adding more housing options. Um, and then there's there's very, you know, Republican leaning states um, that have their own housing problems as well. You know, um, one of one of them would be like I think of Houston, you know, it's 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 zoning is an absolute mess. Um uh, you can see that of how now it, it's it's being affected by you know the the storms that come in and they they can't they can't keep their infrastructure up to up to speed there and you know then there's a the whole electrical grid thing issue but uh, my my point being is that yes you know we can we economists can quill about do they really have it worse off or not but I think on the big most salient metrics and housing is going to be the biggest one followed by cars right that we observe that we interact with every day. They feel worse off. And then on their career, you know, they again, they're they're looking at a lot less uh, employer loyalty and a lot more moving around. And now, because of the advent of the internet really coming online, um, the ability to do things like what you and I are doing now, Google Meet, Zoom, Slack, the people that, you know, college degree students are competing against are not just in their city they're in their country they're in other countries so i i think i can understand and sympathize a bit with, with our with our younger generations here Yeah, Stephen Povick joining us, economists. I think there's something here. You tell me because you're in the economist circles, but at least on the commentary side, and economists are a lot like journalists. There's great investigative journalists, and then there's folks that just talk on TV that occasionally do it by accident, but they're probably not really journalists because they're TV stars now. You have some of that in economics. Let's just be honest about it. Um, in economic circles, at least in we the do. commentary circle, and the people that we see on TV and the people that get columns and the people that do media a lot, and I've talked to some of them at, you know, conferences and green rooms and things like that. I don't know that some of the economist experts and I'm not anti experts. We need experts, but experts. I hope need, you're not anti expert, Andrew. Or I'm going to stop talking to you. Well, you're, you're an expert in some things and not others, but we'll talk about that at some other point. Mm -hmm. We need a good expert class. I think the expert class, I get the sense is and this dribbles over to our political class because old head economists love to get into policy and make some easy money, right? Let's just call it what it is. I've been to DC enough. I've seen that pipeline. When you get into presidential politics, Congress politics, US Senate, the high level federal stuff, a lot of those older head economists that have the influence on them things, I don't get the sense that they understand that the American economy is different now than even 10 or 15 years ago. And it's definitely different than 40 years ago. We are not a manufacturing economy anymore. We are a service-based economy. And I wonder if just a little bit of that stuck in that mental rut or whatever you want to call it, I don't know that they fully understand that we are in a dynamic service-based economy now because they don't talk like it. They still talk about manufacturing and other things. Not that they're not important, but the service sector economy that we have is a different beast than that. And it just seems like, I don't know if it's a blind spot. I don't know if it's a rut, whatever you want to call it. Some of these old head economists talking about this stuff, it's like they're they're talking about something that doesn't exist anymore. I think that's a, I think that's fair. I mean, look, if I look at the econ journals that I read and the articles that are written in those journals, you know, there's a there's a pretty good um, attention paid to the differences in the economy um, and the location choices because I pay attention to location choice literature quite a bit about why we choose where we live. Um, about the changes in the economy, about the changes in the job market, and how it's affecting things, and how it's it's not like what it was. I mean, heck, I, I personally like 
I wrote my dissertation about the role that housing costs have in moving us, especially the high skill workforce into different cities. COVID happens. And honestly, all that research that I did for 10 years is now done, cooked. Might as well throw it out in the trash because remote work is, is changing that. And in 10 years, it'll probably be even more. Um, so, oh, well, I have a I have a very nice paperweight now. Uh, of research that I, you know, that I, that I, that I could use to, to hold down my daughter's drawings. You know, that's about its worth at this point. Um, yes, look, Andrew, the, the pundit class, doesn't matter if you're a political pundit, sports pundit, economics pundit, TV pundit. They all get famous. They all get a following for something they've done. And you're going to play that trick as long as you can. The researcher class, that's fairly dynamic. You know, so I would the way I think about it is, yeah, the talking heads that you see and all these things, probably not the best representative of of you know whichever cast of experts, you know, they would claim to represent. Um, the folks that that are more you know, deep in the nitty gritty, your standard professors at universities the smart ones that are out at think tanks, you know, et cetera, like that, that are doing the work, but behind the scenes and, you know, they're not on TV, but they're writing papers, right? They're writing white papers, publishing, you know, they're the ones that are probably seeing these things. But, you know, we're, you know, as economists, we've, we're trying to get better at Twitter, but, you know, then, then Twitter sort of does its Twitter thing. Um, and now we're trying to search for, for new mediums to, to, to get more information out. You're not as bad off as the philosophers are. They're, they're an absolute train wreck on Twitter. Stephen Pavic joining us. Economist. So here, here's the big ticket item on this. We're in election year. You can't, you know, everybody, when, when, if the Fed does a rate cut in September, everybody's going to howl. Oh, it's because of the election. No, it's not. They plan these things out ahead of time. My, my old line that I've heard for all my life, and I think it's truer the older I get, president gets too much blame and too much credit for the economy. I think, I think that's an established fact. How do we parse through what we're going to hear in the political campaign, especially now that this with the switch and with uh, Vice President Harris and Trump, this isn't going to be a policy election. This is going to be a vibe election. This is going to be a generational change election. That's what this is going to be now. It's not going to be a policy heavy election. However, they're going to talk a lot about the economy because it's still the economy stupid. So two questions on this. One is, is there any big economic change coming between now and and November, which I know you don't know, but that's your job. You got to opine on it anyway, because, hey, look, the economy doesn't go bad. I'm not sure McCain loses to Obama. And I know now in hindsight, Obama looked like a juggernaut, but that race changed when the economy swung. Um, George W. Bush got lucky on some economic stuff, right? And then 9-11 happened and the economy went bad and he wrote it out. The economy matters. The economy yeah. vibes in 92 got Clinton elected over George H.W. Bush. So is there anything on the horizon we should be watching in the economy? And two is, how do we turn down the noise on the promises of the presidential candidates, even though one's the sitting VP and the other one's a previous presidential candidate? So they have established records in the White House of what they do and don't do. Mm -hmm. But how do we parse that out with, oh, wait a minute, Congress has to do that. Or, oh, wait a minute, that's a local function. Or, oh, wait a minute, the Supreme Court's going to shut that down. How do we parse through the noise of what we're going to hear on all these pie in the sky economic policies? So I won't say what's going to happen in the next few months, but I, except for I'll say the Fed gives a rate cut in September, right, which they've been signaling openness to doing for a while now. It's not a surprise. It has nothing to do with any political ramifications for Trump or for Harris now. Um, but it clearly is a boon to the Harris campaign, right, to have that rate cut you know, come in help bring things down a little bit. People see the interest rates come down right before they have to cast the ballots. You know, it'd be a good sign. You know, the Republican camp is going to spin this jobless report, you know, in, in a negative way. Um, the Democrats are going to spin in a positive way. They're going to focus on the incoming rate cut. Um, I, I think that we still have a very healthy overall economy. It's been running great for a number of years. Um, some of that is due to the policies of, President Trump and some of it's due to the policies of, of President Biden, but probably 80% of it is due to other things that happened outside of those two, right? I completely agree with you that presidents get way too much credit and blame. Um, so what can we expect? Well, one, 
you know, I think that even before there was a switch over in the Democrats, you know, my, my political punditry is going to come in here. My, my understanding is that there was an expectation that the House was going to flip. If the House flips, you know, we're stuck with divided government yet again. And we know what happens when you have divided government. Not much. Um, you get a bunch of which is not always a bad thing. <laughs> you get a bunch of continuing resolutions, an omnibus bill that everybody will complain about, uh, and a couple of post offices that are named. That that is that is the what happens. Um, what I will say, what I think I'm picking up from the from both campaigns and from the party apparatus as a whole is, I think we're going to wind up getting a less crypto skeptical um, governance government, I should say, in the next four years. I mean, Donald Trump is trying to woo crypto voters. Um, some of it might be genuine based on donors. Some of it might be disingenuous trying to just get people to vote for him. So it's, it's the same thing probably for the Democrats as well. But it seems like, you know, where, where, they're, where, they're, try, where they're sort of putting pushing Elizabeth Warren to the side a little bit and, and, and showing more interest in, in doing something with this cryptocurrency space. Um, so I think regardless of who wins, like I think my big change is going to be that you're going to see a CFTC and an SEC that's going to be a bit more friendly to crypto. I don't know how that all plays out, you know, for the whole economy. I think it's still a bit player, so to speak, um, in the economy. Um, but that would signify a pretty sizable, you know, shift, I think, in in, a, in an emerging topic. Um, otherwise, you know, we'll continue to see, you know, the, the geopolitical tensions play themselves out in China and in Russia, you know, and their, and their ongoing conflicts that they have. Probably more of the same. You know, I, it, you know, I, I, I think that we'll see the Fed slowly raise the rates. I mean, I'm sorry, cut the rates. My apologies, cut that out. They'll cut the rates down, but it'll be a very slow process. Can I be so, cynical for just a second on this? I saw Trump at the crypto conference. He had no idea what crypto was. I listened to his He doesn't have a no, clue. No, no, no. I mean, yeah, yeah, no. Yeah. He, he said that he wanted to have a crypto, we want a cryptocurrency reserve. Yeah, he's thinking, in the US yeah, he was which, thinking we were going to put it in Fort Knox and keep it. Like, he doesn't even understand what the concept is. However, the people around him are. technically do that in cold storage, but, you know. Yeah. Let's, let's put um, that aside. <laughs> my antenna has gone up with this sudden swing, especially from the GOP folks. Because, let's be honest, they picked J.D. Vance as their running mate. So it's it's the tech bro kind of wing of the party. The, yeah, those, the whatever wing term. of the party. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if you want to talk about it, my antenna went up. And you tell me if this is too cynical. Because I can be overly cynical. But the first thing I thought was like, oh, they're just this is highly volatile stuff that doesn't actually have any fungible values. They're just setting up for the big government bailout when this all crushes them. Is that too cynical? Because that's sure what it, that's the first thought I had when they're like, and then when I looked at this legislation, which is god awful bad legislation they're pushing, I'm You're like, talking about the Loomis legislation. Yes, the Loomis legislation. Yeah. I'm like, this is 100 percent putting the things in. So when these guys lose their shirt, guys, gals, and whatever else, when these people lose their shirt in crypto because it was the hot new thing, that's not a hot new thing. As soon as everybody decides it's not the hot new thing anymore, they want a government bailout. To, to bulwark them up because they know this thing's volatile. That's the first thing I thought. So what I'd say about the the Loomis bill is, I, I you know, if we think about it for two seconds, like so, it wants us to have a trillion dollar Bitcoin reserve or whatever. I think I forget the dollar amount, but maybe it was that. Um, so first, um, the United States government already owns a size amount of Bitcoin. You want to take a guess as to about how much the United States owns in Bitcoin? The well, government it, itself? It, it varies so much. So I would think hundreds of billions of at least at a minimum. Uh, it's about 1.4 trillion, I think. God, oh, I okay. hope I'm not getting that wrong. Maybe it's maybe it was 14 trillion, but I think it's 1.4 trillion. Um, if I got the decimal point wrong, apologies. I just read that earlier this week. But regardless, my point stands here that I'm going to make is we already have a trillion dollar Bitcoin reserve. The United States government already has it. And it's it's Bitcoins that, that has been seized for illicit activities. So, you know, first, I, I'm just not quite understanding why we'd want to have the 
U.S. government assets tied up in a highly volatile speculative instrument. Secondly, you know, why, why would the cryptocurrency community be uh, thrilled with the U.S. government becoming a major player and the holder of Bitcoin? Right? That's a red because flag to me, but <laughs> then then you start getting closer and then you start setting up a government to be able to do a 51% attack. Um, and that that is where with the cryptocurrency, if you own 51% of the net, network or 50.001% of the network, you know, um, you effectively control the network. Um, third, why does the US government need to support the price of Bitcoin? Um, isn't it around like 70K right now? I think it's higher than it's been. You know, it se keeps seeming to hit at all time highs. It's clearly not $4,000, which it was back in 2018, six years ago. So it doesn't seem that there's a need for any government apparatus to prop up the, the price of Bitcoin. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I don't think that you can, I, I don't know if there would be a bailout per se. like. I don't know how you would bail out something where you can't even, where, there, where there's not a um, a bank that, that has deposits for it. You know, like we, we've done that sort of a bail in the past. I don't know how you bail out a Bitcoin. Um, but but clearly they're, they're trying to integrate it more in, into our government policy. But, you know, it, it just, there's probably better uses for a trillion dollars of money. And you and I would probably have different ideas about, what we could do with a trillion dollars, but they whatever idea either of us have, it would be a better idea than buying them. Stephen Popek, let's get off Bitcoin for a minute because we get into the weeds and and the, let's round back off on economics where we started practical stuff. Recession coming, recession not coming because it's a political year. So the people that are against the current administration are going to scream that we've been in a recession. People that are in the people, the people that are going to vote for the people already in power are going to say, no, we're not in a recession. That's how this is going to break down. Are we? Will we be? Can we be? Uh, magic eight ball says not likely. I, I'm glad you brought up the inverse yield curve and we're going to handle this because we've gotten long. I remember Twitter just going nuts over inverse yield curve. So the SOM rule feels like a lot like that. So if we, you're saying if there's a couple other things that compile on it, but in and of itself, because we are somewhat in uncharted territory on an economy that we have right now. So indicators are just that they're indicators. They're not rules. Yeah, and unfortunately, you know, uh, for two years I had I had a word that I used to describe the economy on you with this podcast, and now if I say that word, people are going to think I'm saying something politically charged. So I, I, I can't call the economy what I think it is right now. I think it's a hot mess. Is that fair enough? Can we say it's a hot mess, not just because of the numbers, but just because of the way people treat it, and it's a political year and all that. So some of it's good, some of it's bad. It's all very confusing, but that's why we have Stephen Poppett come on and explain these things to us because he knows more about it than I do. Buddy, let folks know where they can follow you, keep up with you. That was a good hour-long economics meat sandwich. Let folks know where they can keep up with you until we get you back on now. We got you back in the rotation after a you, nice you, long you break. Can, you can find me on whatever it's called these days, Twitter or X at Moto Economist. Um, I'm always happy yep. to talk to you, Andrew. And yes, I agree with you. It's a very Chelsea Green kind of economy. See, we almost got all the way through without too much of a ref wrestling reference, but uh, our economist buddy was a wrestling referee once upon a time in another life and an agent. But we're going to when, when AEW finally comes apart and we get to do the, the retroactive on that hot mess, we're going to have some fun with that one, buddy. Stephen Popic, uh, good talking, sir. We'll do it again soon. Thanks, Andrew. All right. All the music on her tell is provided under a creative content license from monstercat.com. So, let me...